tech, tech, technically, technically, technically speaking. I ain't talking vegan when I said that I've been eating, making money on the side, but I use it for the money. Welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is all about Cisco VoIP. And what we're going to talk about today is actually call manager. So in our previous lessons, we talked about IP phone boot up, which is connecting a phone to the network. So when you're at work and let's say you probably have like a desk phone, um, how does that desk phone get service? And we kind of talked about the basics of what you need to ha have that phone get a dial tone, right? And then we talked about inbound calling and how a call comes through to our uh, phone and how that operates. And then we talked about outbound calling, when we actually pick up a phone and how does that voice travels to our destination. We went ahead and yesterday, I think it was yesterday, but <laughs> we went ahead and talked about the history of VoIP and Cisco's role in it. And we've learned that VoIP was created by a Black woman, right? So we are very proud to have a Black woman create history, and she's still alive today. And she created, again, voice over the internet protocol, that whole technology. So today, we're kind of going to go more a little bit into um cisco and more so we're going to go into cucm and clustering which we talked about it which is call manager okay now we talked about kind of how the history of voip and and how it started with these uh with these operators who you would just pick up the phone and you say operator can you get me to jim lewis and the operator would be like sure one moment baby and then they would go ahead and plug you like physically plug the line into another line that would transfer you and transfer you and then you'll finally get to jim lewis okay and that right there is what we call pots okay that's a a plain old telephone service and that's kind of coupled with pbx which is a private branch exchange so when we think about just a regular you picking up a phone, a landline phone, and you're making a phone call. And that phone is probably plugged into, well, not probably, but it is <laughs> plugged into a jack in the wall. That's what we call POTS, plain old telephone service. It is the basic form of telephone communication, right? It is one-to-one. -one. It is my phone to your phone. And we call that analog. It is the, again, basic form of communication. It's my analog voice transmitting over copper cables. Those copper cables today, we call them ethernet cables. You probably have to plug an ethernet cable from your computer to your Wi-Fi box because it's just better service. You know, maybe your job requires it as you work from home. Um, or you may have a landline. So you probably know about having an actual cable plugged into the phone and into the wall of the jack. Um, we see Ethernet cables all around. If you're just getting like, if you just have your Wi-Fi box right now, probably somewhere in the room is plugged in to the to the wall, maybe with the Ethernet cable to get the fiber optics. Whatever the case may be, you're using POTS, plain old telephone service. Okay. Now when we talked about those operators and those operators having to plug you in the Jim Lewis, you know, they're all worked in a branch. That branch is a more um public branch exchange, but what we have for every single business is a private branch exchange, which means that we have our own little operator in every single business. So if you was to work for T-Mobile, or you was to work for AT&T, or you was to work for Vanguard, or you can work for freaking Nike, it doesn't matter. Every single company has their own, well, at least company that gets big enough to afford it, has their own mini operators, which is called a private branch exchange, okay? Now, they didn't have like their own like work operators to where they actually, you know, could talk back to you. It was more in an automatic sense where there was a computer generated to automatically get the calls, automatically sense that, that, that audio on the electrical wires and automatically send that through wires, through wires, through wires to wherever the destination is at. Now, technology advances, and now we get to IP PBX, which is the same PBX, but instead it is based in the internet. What's based in the internet, we call that cloud. So this is a cloud PBX. This is a virtual PBX. This is something that is software-based, okay? It still works the same as, you know, same old same, but we virtualize it. Why do we virtualize it? Because we don't want big old hardware everywhere. Hardware is expensive. 
we have to, you know, we have to um, hire people to maintenance the hardware. Then we have to, you know, keep repairing it. It's just a lot going on. So why not take that big hardware, condense it into small hardware, and then virtualize it into thousands of, you know, virtualized hardwares, right? Um, and again, it's software based. So that's where we're at now. IP PBX. So it's still an operator. We're still switching calls from your phone to the next phone automatically, but this time it's cloud-based, okay? And that's where VoIP is able to do its thing. That's where the voice, your audio, is able to carry over the internet because we have an internet-based call operating system, <laughs> right? Uh, and today, with Cisco at least, that is called CUCM, Cisco Unified Communication Manager. Now, I am a voice engineer, so this is, I use call manager daily, right? I use it all the time. And today at work, I was kind of tasked to um, go over call manager and its basics and kind of teach some of the low level technicians um, or even lower tier uh, engineers how to use call manager and what's call manager about and all this other good stuff. Now, as you go, as you guys go through this, I do have like extra little uh, information about you know pots and 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 uh, PBX and such and that, but we're not going to go too deep into it. Um, I don't want you guys to get you know too lost because that's all we do as voice network engineers. We just focus on voice and video only. So it may seem like oh that's it, but it's a whole rabbit hole. And again, I don't, they'll probably take us, you know, a few, uh, few hours to get through it. So I'm just going to really show you guys where to access the material. So you can really just go over in depth what we've been talking about. Now, the private branch exchange is something that you really want to make sure that you understand because a lot of people get it uh, confused. Now, we know what a PSTN is. The PSTN is a collection of telephone networks, is a collection of telephone poles. You can probably look outside your window right now and see a, a pole with wires hanging around going to the next pole, to the next pole, to the next pole. That is a telephone pole, okay? That carries our voice and video data. Well, it carries our voice specifically, okay? So if I want to make a phone call, I use those telephone poles. Now, if I wanted to make a VoIP telephone call, a call that travels over the internet, then I would use internet service. I wouldn't use a PSTN network. I would use an ISDN. We talked about that a few videos ago. And the ISDN network is the internet network. But we're just, we just care right now about sending voice calls. So we just use our own cloud, which is a cloud of collection of telephone poles. Okay, now those collection of telephone poles, one of those poles, and one of those wires are leased to our company. It doesn't matter what company you work for. You can work for a telecommun telecommunications company, or you can work for a bank, or you can work for an investment firm, or maybe you started your own company. <laughs> doesn't matter. You are going to use, um, you know, the telephone networks to, to send out your calls. Now, again, every company has its own PBX, a private branch exchange. It is just a hardware where it kind of like it's your call control. It's where your calls originate and your calls terminate. And if you wanted to do like music on, if you wanted to put someone on hold and the music will give them like a music on hold, or if you wanted to transfer someone to tier two or to your boss or just to somewhere else um, or whatever you wanted to do, you know, uh, those Features in those settings are all controlled by the PBX, okay? Now, the PBX, it's an actual hardware device. It's connected through the wall jack, right? Just like we have our phone, our regular landline connected in the jack of the wall, okay? And then uh, our phone will have a jack as well. And it's going to, well, it's going to have a port that we can plug into with the cables. And, um you know, we're going to plug it into the PBX. So it's still the same old pots, right? Plain old telephone service. It's still the same thing we talked about. It's just now we have a call, an operator, an automatic operator in the middle of it all, okay? Um, you may have to go a little deeper with reading some of, uh, going a little bit into the paragraphs. Uh, I did bring, get some links for you guys to go kind of deeper into PBX, 
but make sure that you really understand that the PBX is just like own call control. It's its own operator for that business, okay? It's its own, you know, main control center for a specific business, for a specific network, all right? Now that thing is hardware, it's whatever. We virtualize it into IP PBX. We virtualize it into a cloud call manager. Let's talk about call manager. Now, you're going to hear a bunch of words. You're going to hear a bunch of like terms for it. CUCM stands for Cisco Unified Communications Manager. So you actually may hear people say Cisco Unified Communications Manager. You might hear people say CUCM. You might hear people say just call manager. You might hear people say CCM, right? You know, um, our Cisco call manager. It's so many names, but just know simply it's our call manager, right? It is our cloud-based PBX system. It is software, okay? And we use IP addresses to make and receive phone calls, all right? This um, call manager is a server. So what we would do is we would buy a server, a real life hardware server that costs thousands of dollars. And we'll probably buy, you know, a couple hundred. It depends on the, how big the company is, but you can probably get one or you can probably have like a hundreds of them. And you take this server and what you will do is you will put um, you will put a, a software on it and virtualize it. OK, and that software is going to house a Cisco Unified Communication Manager. And let's just go down a little bit more because I don't want to get too deep. I just want to kind of give it on a surface level. Um, so with call manager, it uses a database. So we talked about in the boot camp uh, using, you know, SQL language and databases that come from IBM. Now, Cisco uses just that. It uses a IBM database for storing all the data. What data is it storing? It's storing what we talked about in, in outbound calling. It's storing our dial plan. It's storing dialable numbers that we can dial outside of the company. Um, it's storing configurations on what type of protocols we can use to actually make these phone calls. Um, it's storing, you know, probably phone call records, who called me in a year's time or who I called out. Um, so many things this database is holding. Maybe the hold music that you want to put for your customers to hold, you know, you, instead of having like a dead silent hold, you want them to listen to something like how AT&T is or how most of these pl places are. Um, so you have, you know, a database to store those files and such. And that database is an IBM type of database, okay? Now, where does CUCM actually get installed? It gets installed, like we said, on the hardware, but that hardware is virtualized into a software, which is another virtualization of a computer, right? It's just a, a software version of a computer. Now, this software version of a computer, we have to add um, an operating system to it. So we wouldn't add Windows. We wouldn't, we wouldn't add Mac. We would add Linux and specifically Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So that's why I tell you guys to kind of, you know, get involved in Linux as well, because, you know, it'll help you more out with this, uh, with this position. Now, myself, I didn't know Linux when I started voice engineering. I knew it as I started um, what we call spinning up servers. So when I actually was on the build of deploying call manager, I had to understand Linux and understand it basically on hands-on experience. So, you know, you guys have kind of like an advantage to kind of get a little bit of Linux in you, at least the commands, the basic commands or navigating it a little bit and you'll be good to go, right? It's really, for me, it's really just a terminal. It's just working without a pretty graphic user interface. Regardless, call manager is, um, is basically created from the operating system Linux, okay? It is an enterprise operating system as far as Red Hat Enterprise is concerned. So we use that for call manager. That's our operating system. We go ahead, if you ever built the virtual machine and you kind of already know the steps, you go ahead and just tell it this how much memory I want, this how much you know gigs I want, and then the computer, um, your hypervisor will create a virtualized computer for you and then you will literally um, you will literally configure that computer with an operating system. Most of the time, if you're in the, the boot camp, you're probably configured like a Windows AD server. But 
you know, instead of using Windows, instead of using Mac, we use Linux. And then we just build upon that, right? So if you was to put a Windows operating system on a computer, imagine what you could do with Windows. You'd be like, hey, I mean, maybe want to look at Chrome or maybe want to download Zoom or you want to download so many other things. For this, we're only going to download Call Manager and Call Manager other services, right? Or at least um, unified communication services, all right? Virtualization, we kind of went in, but this is something that you must always just know at the top of your head. You should really know um, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Those are the really ma three main types of virtualization. Okay, we use virtualization every day. We probably don't even, probably don't even realize that you do. So it starts off with infrastructure as a service, IaaS, and it's really just giving you the servers. So just like maybe AWS, for example, you may get make an account for AWS to house some data for you. Maybe to house your YouTube videos or maybe to house your homework or something, or maybe you're a chef and it's housing your recipes. Regardless, you just want a server so you can go ahead and build your own stuff on it. It's literally just giving, it's literally someone else having the server and they're renting you out virtual space so you can use and build whatever you want to build, AKA AWS. And then we have PaaS, Platform as a Service, P-A-A-S. This is where you build. So it gives you not only the server, you know, the cloud storage space like AWS, it also gives you the OS like Mac, Windows, Linux, and it gives you stuff to where you can build off of it. Most of the time, software developers use stuff like this. Um, I would say, what's a, what's a platform as a service business? Docker. Uh, Docker is definitely one um, I can't remember any, or Docker is just really coming up to my, to my head, but Docker is definitely a platform as a service. And then we have SaaS, software as a service, S-A-A-S, and that's where we consume. Um, that's where they give you not only the server, not only the operating system, but also the application. That application is, can be as simple as Gmail, right? That's a SaaS. Um, let's see, TripAdvisor, right? I don't know if they're a software. They're probably not a software. But um, think of like a software-based Zoom. Zoom is a software. Anything that we use that houses, you know, we don't keep the data on hand. They keep all the data. We just log in with a password and a username and check whatever we want to check and do whatever we want to do. And the easiest thing I could think of is really like Gmail, like an email provider. That's a, a SaaS, that's virtualization in a SaaS type of way, in a software as a system, so a software as a service, excuse me, okay? So definitely understand virtualization because it is very, very important as a network engineer and very, very important as a voice network engineer. We virtualize everything, AKA we put everything in the cloud. What is the cloud? The cloud is nothing but someone else's computer. And most of the time it is a, you know, basement <laughs> full of like thousands of computers that are virtualized and are sent out to everyone around the world for them to use. For example, AWS, okay? Now call manager, we went ahead, virtualized our server, added an operating system, which is Linux, and then went ahead and um, installed call manager on that operating system. Now we have a server where all our calls can be controlled and can manage and all that good stuff. Now we have something called a call manager cluster. A call manager cluster has up to 20 servers in it. It's nothing but a, it's nothing but a call manager, which is that one server, plus other servers that the call manager needs to help it do everything else it needs to do. And we call that a cluster because it's one server plus many other servers, which equals up to 20 servers, right? And it's just a bunch of servers together. And we just, again, call that a cluster. Uh, you're going to hear cluster a lot in, in engineering. Um, and it's going to mean a lot of different things. But at the core of it, it just means a, a bunch of like-minded groupings, right? It's a category of things. So in this cluster, in this call manager cluster, we have one publisher. A publisher is the main call control. It is our call manager. It is the main house. We call that a publisher. Now we also have 
another type of we other excuse me we also have other call manager servers but those are like our secondary servers those are our servers where they can do call processing meaning that they actually do the meat and potatoes of the calls the publisher which is the main call manager it's really just the house of everything it's just where all the rules are housed all the configurations all the protocols every single thing is housed in it and then that thing is, is that publisher is duplicated to our subscribers. And we can have, let's see, yep, it says up to eight subscribers we can have, meaning the subscriber is the secondary to a publisher. It is the secondary call manager. Why do we need a secondary call manager? Excuse me. One, we need at least one secondary call manager to just process calls because our call manager needs to do what it needs to do, which is manage and control and house everything. We don't need it to process calls. It's doing too much. We're overloading our server. So let's create a whole nother server, a secondary server with the same configurations, but this one, it actually process calls. Now we can have up to eight of these subscribers. Why would we want up to eight? because maybe we're a big company and we need to make sure that we can load balance between all of these calls. Maybe you work for a call center. Maybe you're like at Apple call center. You're like, hey, welcome. Thank you for calling Apple. How can I help you? You know, Apple's pretty big. So I'm pretty sure Apple has more than eight subscribers because so many people will call their 1-800 number asking for help. So they need more than one node to our server to be able to process that, that, that call flow, okay? now. Clusters, again, we are call manager cluster is nothing but a bunch of call manager servers. So we have eight subscribers and then we have one publisher, that's nine. So you're probably asking, where's the other 11? The other 11 deals with other services such as um, maybe instant messaging and presence. So if you wanted to send an instant message, we call that Jabber. Cisco has a proprietary chat, which is called Jabber. Um, you may hear about Microsoft. They have a proprietary one called Teams. Um, Zoom itself, we can chat in the meeting chat. You know, Zoom has its own chat. Um, again, so many other instant messaging uh, and presence providers, but Cisco has their own, which is Jabber. Um, another one down here, we have TFTP. We talked about that when we were talking about IP phone Buddha. TFTP is about housing files so we can grab those files and do whatever we need to do with it. For our case as a voice engineer, those files would be phone configurations, phone firmware. So if we want to update the software on the phone, that software file would be housed on the TFTP server, uh, which stands for trial, uh, Trivial File Transfer Protocol, okay? And then it says uh, media resources. So then you have servers that you can dedicate for just conferencing and music on hold and transcoding and all these other things that you wanna do in the business. Because it's one thing to make phone calls, but isn't it great to not only make phone calls, but be able to transfer phone calls or be able to conference in and say, hey, I'm gonna do a three-way, I'm gonna do a four-way. You know, like it would be great to be in a meeting like how we are now and Zoom. If we were in a Cisco environment, this meeting wouldn't be called Zoom, it would be called WebEx. You guys probably have dealt with WebEx before. It's nothing but a Cisco proprietary Zoom. <laughs> Cisco, again, likes everything to have its name on it. So when you use one thing, you probably end up having to trickle down to use everything Cisco, okay? Um, so if you work in an environment to where uh, it is a Cisco environment, you'll see that They'll do phone calls, they'll do meetings, like we're having a meeting right now. But again, instead of Zoom, instead of Skype, it'll be Cisco WebEx, okay? We will chat with each other. We can chat right now, like in Discord. We can chat right now, like uh, like in our Zoom chat. But if you're in the Cisco environment, it will be called Jabber. That's the instant messaging system, okay? And again, all those different servers just create a call manager cluster. Now, what I'm teaching you guys is really like architect. <laughs> this is really architect level. Um, most of the time, engineers don't know most of this information. It's good to know it on a like a real like high level. Um, but if you're the one that's really doing it as far as coming in, 
learning like, okay, well, we have a server. The server's probably a, 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 a Cisco UCS server. And then we're going to virtualize it. We're going to use Linux. Um, we're going to set up all our configurations. And, you know, like if you're doing the build up from a ground up with call manager, you're definitely getting paid like, you know, $100 an hour type type ish because it's architect work. But if you can at least understand um, call manager on a high level, what is call manager? What is it used for? If I say call manager cluster, what does that kind of bring to you? You don't probably have to give you the steps on how to do it, but you should be able to at least talk to it. That right there will definitely get you to at least 80 to 90K. And again, I learned this stuff within, you know, realistically, I learned it in six months, right? I learned network engineering in 30 days, but I've learned this stuff in six months, really just on the job learning a lot for the past like year. And boom, here we are. So you guys can take this information right here and do the same thing I just did. There is literally no reason why you want to go to college. It's been waste your four years. There's no need to, you know, waste the next two years. Learn this right now. Give yourself hardcore three months and you will definitely double your income for sure. Okay. Now, just going in a little bit more here when we talk about clustering. Okay. A cluster is literally, again, it's just a whole bunch of servers, a whole bunch of call manager servers and we have 20 of them. We call those nodes. So you may hear us interchange and say 20 nodes, 20 servers. Regardless, a node is a server, a server is a node, okay? Why are we clustering? Like I said, we're clustering because we may have a high call volume. Like we may be a really big company. So let's say, you know, we have 40,000 endpoints, 40,000 phones, for example, you know, we can't just use one node, one server. We're gonna need multiple servers if we have all these endpoints, okay? And again, it's architecting. So you're really figuring out how many people are in this company? How many people need a phone or need voice and video access in this company? Okay, so now how many devices do I need to, to make sure that these people can make calls, right? And now you have devices. Now you need to figure out what services do you have to configure on those devices? because of those users, right? So it's really building from the ground up. Now, one thing I did wanna bring up here is database replication. Literally, the publisher is the main wheelhouse. All is there is to make sure that everybody behaves. Now we have things that trickle down from the wheelhouse, which is the secondary um, call manager, right? And we, have, we can have up to eight of those. Those actually process the calls. So when you pick up the phone and you're ready to dial something and you're trying to call your aunt or you're trying to call Pizza Hut, it's literally using subscriber nodes. It's not going to use a publisher node. Again, it's too much work on our publisher. We want to make sure that everyone has enough roles and responsibilities to not be overworked, but still get the job done. Okay? We want redundancy and high availability. If you can understand that, you will definitely have a bright future in network engineering because all we care about is high availability, which means that the network is always up. You know, the network should be up 99.99999% of the time. Where's that 1% go in case we need to do a backup or we got to, you know, restore something for whatever purpose, okay? But it should always be up. And the second thing is redundancy. If it's not up, it should be up within a split second because we have another server that's going to catch it on the back end. Our end users shouldn't even see the hiccup that something died and something else had to be the backup. Our end users should not be affected, right? That should just be like alerts on our end, like, oh, our server went down. But they're still making calls in the call center, okay? Now, this is good, database replication, because if our server goes down, if our servers cannot... Du duplicate, if the publisher cannot duplicate itself to the subscribers, that's an issue. Because, or if our subscribers can't duplicate to the publisher and say, hey, I have some new information, update your database, it's, it's an issue, right? Because now things are not being synchronized together and who knows what's going to happen. So for our database to uh, replicate, it goes into these five stages, okay? Now, we want to make sure that these stages are really 
um, we we, we want to know what these stages are so we know how to get help. As a network engineer, you're not doing it by yourself. You have a whole team. And if your team don't know anything and you're like the smart one in the box, then you're going to have to call your vendor, the person, the company that supplies you with these products and services. So if you're having issues with your Apple phone, who do you think you're going to call? You're going to call Apple. Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go on Google and you're going to Google What's going on with my phone? My phone does not turn on. My phone is not charging. You're going to Google that because you're self-sufficient. And then you're going to look on Apple's support documents and read the steps on how to troubleshoot your phone because you're a smart person. Let's say that doesn't work. Now, what you can do is you have a 1-800 number. You can call Apple and say, hey, Apple, I tried the, 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 I tried the troubleshooting steps on your website. It's not working. I need you to walk me through something. OK, we had the same thing with Cisco. So we tried. We did our Googling. It still didn't work. Now we call Cisco and Cisco is called TAC, Technical Assistance by Cisco. I think that's what TAC is. Regardless, TAC is who we call when we don't know how to fix our own issues. OK, so we have people that have people that have people there. We're always going to have help. Now, our database replication. Now we have zero through four. If it gets to four. That means that you should probably call Cisco as a P1, which means emergency, because my database is not collecting data, saving data, and replicating this data. So it can be in my database, right? If you're if you're taking photos on your iPhone and you're you like to back it up to iCloud, imagine when iCloud goes down. They're gonna be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I need this back up because I can't lose my pictures. I can't lose my my contacts, my photo, my my videos. So you're going to, you know, you're going to turn up. So that's the same thing. We want it to turn up. Hey, tag P1. P1 means emergency. Again, as you go through, you know, your path as a network engineer, you'll see a lot of things that you won't touch, but you will see a lot of things that you've learned. Again, it's good to have the knowledge of. So when it's, when the database is not replicating, we have these little numbers to show us. We call tag, do a P1. We usually have what's called a change freeze. That means that everyone needs to halt. You cannot make any changes, any changes. No, add no, you cannot add new phones. You cannot add new voicemails. Stop all the configurations, okay? Something is happening with our database and we need to fix it now, okay? So database replication is very important. Please understand it. Again, if it gets all the way down to four, that means that your database is not saving, your iCloud is down, for an example, um, and that's a problem, okay? Um, I gave you some steps here just to get you going with the learning. You kind of can go more into what the value zero means, what one means, what two means, what three, what four, um, where you would look to see this stuff. Like, okay, where do I look to see database is replicating? You would actually look at it in the terminal, in the Linux terminal. OK, so if you're looking here, that's kind of what it looks like. And it's going to show you, is this replicating right here? I don't know if you guys can see it. Hopefully you can. Um, but right over here, it says the setup status and this replication status is at two. So let's take a look at two. What does two mean? Two means replication is good. Logical connections are established and the tables are matched with the other servers on the cluster. Oh, we good. So there's nothing going on with our, our database. So now we can troubleshoot some other stuff, right? Or whatever. But if it's not two, you're, you're, you're in trouble. You know, if it's zero, you need to wait and be like, okay, maybe it's doing something. You know, if it's one, that means that, okay, well, maybe it's still going through something. Let me give it a few moments, maybe. Two is good. You can go on about your day, do other troubleshooting steps. Three means that something is wrong and you need to fix it. And four means that it's just, maybe you should call for help. Clearly you don't know. <laughs> That's kind of what the stages are saying. And again, you're, you're, you're looking at this in the terminal. Terminal looks like this. And you're gonna run this command. That's how you get to the, to the, to the database state is running this command, okay? Literally copy and paste it, boom. And you'll see this pull up, okay? I'm again, I'm teaching you guys this on a very high level, on a very architect level, because in your first job, unless you kind of already in network engineer team, unless you're already on that team, um, they won't let you touch this. 
<laughs> they're not going to let you touch these commands. You're not going to get into Linux. You're not going to do anything with this database because you're a newbie and you're going to mess up our network and we don't trust you. OK, now you can watch us go into this. And I even taught a senior network engineer how to do this. So trust me, they do not want you doing anything. But the fact that you have the knowledge of it and you can already, you know, kind of know what to do if something fails, what troubleshooting steps to take, what does it mean when your database is not replicating? Why is it important for your database to replicate? Just coming on with that knowledge is makes you a valuable asset. OK, so, yes, you won't be actually doing this, but just having this knowledge gives you that money. You know, it's really good to to be to have architect all this good knowledge and they pay you money. But your job is literally just, you know, ones and twosies. <laughs> right. Um, more to go more in deep into what we talked about as far as call manager and clustering. Uh, I gave you some links here, which is to remote in to repair the database. If you, again, had issues with it, you kind of can go more into it. Um, load balancing, because we have clusters. We have 20 nodes, 20 servers. It's so many servers we can do to have independent jobs. So again, what we're doing is we're load balancing. We're balancing the load that's coming in. So as, as, as calls are uh, incoming, we have outgoing calls. We have people, we have things to where we have voice mailboxes. We have um, to where you can press one for sales, press two for customer service, press three for repeat your account. You know, we have all these IVR systems and we have so many things where you can, you know, get different files and get different data from. That's all called load balancing. We're all just making sure that our servers have certain responsibilities to balance the load, the workload, the call load, okay? Because there's so much going on. I mean, I know you probably think like, well, it's just a phone call and it's just voicemail and it's just, you know, music on hold. But those are resources that actually get taken up in, in storage that we have to store somewhere. Like we have to know how to store this. Um, so that's why I said it's very specific, you know, we're network engineers, but we only network engineers dealing with voice and video only. And then we, and then I gave you guys some information about one-to-one -one and two-to-one redundancy. Like I said, the name of the game is to be valuable, be an asset to get some money. And the best thing you need to know is how to make sure that your database, make sure that your, your call manager, your servers are always up. They're always running. They're never down. They should run 24-7, 365. And as well as that, they if they do go down, you have redundancy. You have something back up to where it's not even, it's not even a miss, a miss call can happen because a server already backed up and said, uh-huh, I got you while the first one repairs itself. And let's say the second one goes down. We got a third one to come in and say, I got you, just in case the second one go down because the first one went down, right? Redundancy and high availability. That's the name of the game, guys. Okay, so this was really a a a, a kind of a, a simple lesson because I really just wanted to keep it simple with call manager and clustering because it's kind of what I've taught my team today uh, at work. So I figured, why not give you guys this same sauce here because they're getting paid 70, 80 k, and I'm teaching them something that I'm teaching you guys. So uh, why not? Why can't you be in that same position making 70, 80 k? and still learning, right? So take some of this information, apply it, put it on your resume, and let's get these jobs. Okay, guys? Uh, tomorrow, let's see. Not sure what I would do tomorrow. Let's Whatever my team is needs to learn is what I'll probably just start giving to you guys. Uh, we'll probably also start going down the CCNP track because I want you guys to get that certificate because that solidifies your knowledge and solidifies that you are going to make 100K, okay? Um, I'm just showing you guys my path to success. I gave you the season.